Hello, I'm Chris Busby. I'm talking to you, talking to you from the offices of the Swedish anti-nuclear movement, and I'm here with my friends in the Swedish anti-nuclear movement um, to say something a little, say say something about Fukushima uh, to them and to you. Uh, and particularly at the beginning, I should say that we have just published a new book. This, when I say we, I mean my organisation, the European Committee on Radiation Risk (ECRR). And our website is uradcom.org, and we'll write this underneath the, the stripe, um, so you'll be able to read it. Uh, and this book is called Fukushima and Health: What to Expect. Um, the book itself is about three hundred and thirty pages long. And, and, and is uh, effectively um, an outline of the kinds of things that we're going to find in the populations exposed to the radioactivity from Fukushima. Um, the, 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 in science, we have um, uh, the scientific philosophy which tells us that the antecedent conditions of any phenomenon, when repeated, will recreate the phenomenon. This, this is one of the cornerstones of science. It's called the Canon of Agreement. It was uh, first written down by John Stuart Mill. And so we know what's going to happen at Fukushima because we know what happened in Chernobyl, although it's been covered up. It's been covered up by the power of the nuclear lobby and by the connection between the World Health Organization and the International Atomic Energy Agency. I was in um, Ukraine in 2000 at a conference of the... Um, Physicians for Chernobyl, of which I am a member, I am one of the of this organisation in the Ukraine called the Physicians of Chernobyl. And what happened there was that there was a massive cover-up of the effects of Chernobyl in this international conference, which was supposedly uh, organised by the World Health Organisation, but in reality, behind the scenes, was being run by the International Atomic Energy Agency. So these effects have been covered up. But what we have done is uncovered them. When I talk about we, I'm talking about my colleagues in the ex-Soviet Union, in Belarus and in uh, the Ukraine uh, and in the Russian Republic. People like Alexei Yablokov and Mikhail Malko, Rosa Goncharova, Elena Berlikova, people who are major scientists who have studied the effects of Chernobyl on the ground in the territories where these effects have occurred. And one of the most important of these scientists is Yuri Bandashevsky. Professor Bandashevsky studied the effects of radio cesium and of course strontium uh, on children who lived in contaminated areas of, of Belarus. And what he was able to show, and what he found quite early on, was that the cesium attacked the heart, that it, it bound to heart muscle, and in the children it destroyed the heart muscle and it caused arith cardiac arrhythmias and heart attacks. And in this book, um, at this conference in Lesbos in 2009, Bandashevsky um, describes the non-cancer illnesses and conditions in areas of Belarus that were contaminated from, by, by these materials. The same materials, of course, that contaminate the population of northern Japan. So we absolutely know what's going to happen there. And we can predict with, I think, considerable accuracy the numbers of cancers and the number of heart attacks and, and so on. And overall, we can predict a, a, a decimation in the lifespan of people who are living in these contaminated areas as a result of their chronic exposure to these radionuclides like strontium-90, cesium-137, plutonium-239, uh, and a whole devil's brew of materials, including, of course, uranium. And many of these uh, materials are in the form of very small particles, nanoparticles, that can be inhaled and that can go through the skin in, uh, or they can go through the lung into the, into the lymphatic system and into the bloodstream. And once they're in there, of course, they can bind to the DNA and they can cause significant damage. And what I've been trying to do is to, is to advise people living in these areas who can't uh, leave and, I, and first of all, of course, they should they should evacuate. But if they can't evacuate, then they should take calcium tablets because calcium tablets do, in fact, block um, 
block the DNA, uh, remove, re uh, prevent the access of uranium and, and these and strontium to, to the DNA. And so it would have an effect. So if people take these calcium tablets, and they're quite harmless and quite cheap too, they will have a protective effect. So now let's talk about the accident itself. I was on, um, I was on the BBC right from the beginning and on IT ITV in the United Kingdom and also then later on Russia Today and Al Jazeera and various other TV channels talking about the accident. And from the very beginning, whilst the nuclear industry and the International Atomic Energy Agency were blathering on about how it was just some kind of minor hydrogen explosion, anybody who saw on uh, the, 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 the camera work on those explosions, it was quite clear that there had been major, it was a major disaster. Uh, of the order or worse than Chernobyl. And in fact, I think worse than Chernobyl. And the reason is that the population in the area is much, much higher than in the area of the Chernobyl accident. So the Chernobyl explosion, which was a nuclear explosion and not a hydrogen explosion, which we know from the isotope ratios of the xenon isotopes that were measured in St. Petersburg, you can tell from the ratio of xenon-135 to xenon-133 xenon or xenon-131, either of those, whether, whether it's a critical, a critical rea uh, fission, uh, um, a prompt criticality or a nuclear explosion, or whether it's not a nuclear explosion, but just the contents of a nuclear power station that's got blown up into the air by a hydrogen explosion, you can tell the difference from the xenon isotopes. And so we can do, in, in, in essence, the same thing with the xenon isotope ratios from the Fukushima reactor explosion but nobody has published what those concentrations are. So we had these explosions and from the beginning I said that they were major, that this was a major accident whilst everybody else was playing it down. And for a long time the IAEA were producing bulletins that just didn't make sense. They would say that the, that the radioactivity on the ground measured in microsieverts per hour was something and the concentration of the contamination on the ground was something which just didn't fit in. With that, with the with the with the, um, with the dose rate measurements of microsieverts per hour, so we know that they were lying right from the beginning. We know that they were lying, but also from the beginning, on the basis of the uh, risk model of the European Committee on Radiation Risk, it was quite easy to show what the effects would be in terms of cancer. We could use the risk model of the ECRR uh, based on the the the, the dose rates. And we could also use work that had been done by a Swedish uh, epidemiologist, Martin Tondell, on the effects of cancer in northern Sweden. And so I, I put all of this together, together with the measurements that were available of, of contamination of the area at 200 kilometers from the site, and I calculated the death yield from cancer, and that wasn't difficult to do. And I gave this as a paper in May in Berlin. And the result of this was that there was going to be about 400,000 extra cancer, cancers, not deaths, extra cancers in the 200 kilometer area over the next 50 years. And the reason for this is the population of that area is about 7 million. So we know how many cancers there are going to be. But at that time we didn't realize even then that, it, that, that, it was a, that the, the radioactivity had gone as far south as Tokyo. Because during this time, what happened was I was sent, a, uh, I was sent um, car air filters. I'd asked the Japanese people to send me car air filters. And I visited Japan also with a, a scintillation counter and a gamma spectrometer. And I made various lectures in Japan and took samples. And as a result of looking at these car air filters and looking at the, the soil samples that I brought back and samples of material that other people sent me, uh, it was possible to show that the concentration of cesium in the air out to 100 kilometers was approximately 1,000 times higher than the concentration of cesium in the air at the time of the global weapons fallout, which is, which is in the 1960s. And at that time, you, you may recall that President Kennedy and, and President Khrushchev signed an agreement because they were quite aware that these effects were going, th these contaminations from the global weapons fallout were going to result in a, in a, lot, of, a lot of deaths. And in fact, they were quite right because the, the, the current cancer epidemic is a consequence of those uh, materials that were that were produced into the atmosphere at the time of the global weapons atmospheric testing. But what we found in, in, in Japan was that the levels were 1,000 times higher than that, out to 100 kilometers. And one car filter, which I got from Tokyo, showed that even in Tokyo, the levels were 300 times higher. 
And when we put photographic film onto these car filters, so we cut open the car filter and we spread out the, the, the element of the car filter and we put a photographic plate on it, you can see little particles, little splodges of light, where these uh, particles of material from the explosion have landed. So it's not a uniform concentration through the atmosphere, it's little particles, invisibly small particles floating about that you inhale. So the upshot of all of this is three things. First of all, the effects of the accident are going to be alarming and are going to be quite, quite, quite significant. Um, secondly, the concentration of material in the environment out as far as Tokyo, and actually probably much further than that, is, is also significant. Great parts of northern Japan are highly contaminated with this material. Thirdly, the method that's being used to assess the effects of this on the population are the methods of the International Commission on Radiological Protection, which used to be here, used to be here in Stockholm. And in fact, the, the ex-head of the uh, International Commission on Radiological Protection, Lars Erik Holm, is now the Medical Officer of Health for Stockholm, if you can for, for Sweden, if you can believe such a thing. This is, a, by the way, a, a, a serious conflict of interest, in my opinion. However, the methodology of the ICRP is what's being used in Japan to pacify the population. And the methodology is based entirely on external dose. So, so we're told that if the external dose is below so many millisieverts, it should be one millisievert, but they've taken it up to 30 millisieverts, because otherwise everybody would have to get out. So that in itself is a bit questionable. So, they, so, so on the basis of this, so long as it's below 30 millisieverts, nobody is going to get sick. And in fact, last Eric Holm here has been sent out to Japan to be one of the experts that is advising the population of Japan on the health effects. I know. I know. Anyway, don't say a word. We're hoping to bring that guy down, incidentally, using all sorts of magic, human rights stuff. <sighs> Terrible, isn't it? So... The ICRP risk model that depends upon this external radiation dose is wrong. It's completely wrong. It's totally false and people will die as a result of application of it. And I hope that the people who are responsible for applying this method will be ultimately sent to jail. Because the real problem is not the external radiation. The problem is the internal radiation that you get from inhaling these little particles that we discovered on the air filters of the cars. And of course if the cars can inhale these particles, then so can the people of Japan. And then the particle gets inside them and it goes inside them and it causes cancer and it destroys their heart and so forth. So that's what I have to say about Fukushima to my friends here. Let's go back to the book just briefly and you can see what's in the book. So, in the book we see contributions by these eminent scientists, Yuri Bandashevsky, Karmel Mothersil is one of the most famous and most eminent uh, um, scientists uh, working on genomic instability. This is Professor Inga Schmitz Feuerhaker here, who is the um, chairman of the European Committee on Radiation Risk and who has made lots and lots of uh, estimations of the doses to the population affected by the fallout uh, using chromosome damage. Rosa Goncharova is a geneticist, and she talks about uh, her, 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 her work on, on genetics and the effects of low doses of radiation. Um, Professor Sawada has shown that the risk model that we have at the moment is incorrect, not only because of the effects that I'm talking about, but also because, it's, because they didn't take into consideration the fact that there was a lot of fallout. And then we have Professor Malko from Belarus, who, who, who has looked at the effects of, of stomach cancer, the, the, the rates of stomach cancer and thyroid cancer, and show quite clearly that the ICRP risk model doesn't predict those. And Professor Gluzman, and now uh, there's Professor Yablokov. Here's Professor uh, Nyagu, this lady here. Now she's looked at the most interesting studies that she's been doing con uh, concern the uh, effects on the brain and on behavior of children who've been exposed to the Chernobyl radiation. And she shows that there have been reductions in IQ and all sorts of effects on behavior in children exposed to this, which we will ass assuredly find in, um, in Fukushima. So, so these, this, this destroys the, the intelligence and the ability to function 
of, of young people who are exposed to this radiation. Professor Yablokov, of course, who, who, has, who is a, a, a counsellor of the Russian Academy of Sciences, um, who has written a huge book all on his own about the health effects of, of low doses radiation published uh, in Chernobyl, published by the uh, New York Academy of Sciences. And here's um, my friend V.T. Padmanabhan, who's looked at the sex ratio in the offspring and shown that, that the studies on the sex ratio have been, have been covered up by the American authorities and the Japanese authorities who, who did that work, Professors Neil and Shaw. So there's a lot of stuff here. And finally, we have in this paper the Lesvos Declaration, which was made by all of these eminent scientists. And if we go to the end here, we can find, we can find this Lesvos Declaration, because it, it uh, I hope... Because it tells us... I don't think that it's this, not there. this is not the book. This is only the uh, selection. Oh, this is the selection, yeah. Okay, okay. You could show some pages in the selection, maybe. Right. Well, you see, here's an interesting thing. This is, this is from Professor Yablokov. It shows the comparison of the levels of mortality in six Russian areas contaminated by the catastrophe compared with six that were less contaminated. Now, look at that, you see. This is the this is relative mortality. So so this is the number of people living, uh, number of people born versus uh, against, against the number of people dying, and you can see this quite clear effect that more people are dying in the in the contaminated regions than in the control regions, and they die from all sorts of causes. You mm. see, because the rate it's not just cancer. We're not I mean, the ICRP risk model is is basically a model which examines cancer rates. But in fact, what we see here is that it's not cancer. It's just a general reduction in the lifespan of the people who are contaminated, who are exposed. And this is what Bandashevsky found as well. If we go back to the beginning, at the, uh, I think we put in some, some of the Bandashevsky's um, results. Uh, let's see now. Here we are. This is one. Look at this now. This is the demographic index for the Republic of Belarus from 1950 to 2004. And so this is the, what, what the demographic index is. It's the number of people born minus the number of people dying, or rather the other way around. So, so you can see here that more people are dying than are being born after... Suddenly it drops here, after Chernobyl. This is 1986, this point here. And after Chernobyl, it's, it just goes down, 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 the, down like a landslide. This see was that? economical collapse as well. No, no this, is, this was after Chernobyl. This, this, no, is, the, uh, this the, is not the exactly the same the time. Soviet collapsed as well. Then. Not in 1987 it did. Not in 1986 it didn't. It didn't collapse till later. So this was actually at the point of the, of the, uh, of, of the Chernobyl accident that you're seeing here. And another thing that, that he showed here was, um, let's see, was the question of heart attacks, you see. Now look. Oh yeah, these these are the dynamics of the death rates in different districts of Belarus. So here, you know, this is this is nothing to do with the, with social collapse because what you see here is that areas of high levels of radiation you have a different effect to areas of low levels of radiation. Um, so that, but this is the interesting thing. Now look, this is the this is the most important thing that Bandashevsky discovered, and he published this quite early on. This, in fact, I received his first publication. He sent it to me in the West. It was produced on a Samizdat printing press and smuggled out of the country, and I still got this book. It's a little book, and it's called. The, it has the dynamics of of death rates in children who have different levels of cesium one three seven. And you know what they did? His colleague Nestorenko actually made an armchair and put. Con put contamination monitors into the armchair with sellotape, and and he sat children in the armchair and worked out a way of measuring the cesium one three seven in those children in a sort of it was like an armchair with wheels and he used to and they used to wheel it around to the various villages, in the contaminated areas and they used to sit the children in the armchair and measure the radio measure the cesium one three seven in the children, and what they found quite early on was that they had electrocardiograph modifications as a result of the concentrations of cesium inside them. So they were getting uh, heart, heart uh, conduction problems. So you know, the, you, know you get this PQR wave. With, 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 you put an ECG, you get PQR, PQR, PQR. And you can tell from the heights of the different wave parts in the e electrocardiogram whether the heart is functioning properly or not. And of course in the children with the, with the high levels of, of ECG problem... Here, 
you find that um, that those children are having heart attacks and they and they're having cardiac arrhythmias. So they keep falling over. They go white. They don't run about. They're listless. They sit about all the time. They're always sleepy. And of course, you know, because if your heart's not heart's not working properly, that's what you do. And you have big brown circles under your eyes because your circulation is not working properly. And then you have a heart attack and die. And so, and this is these these are the results that he found. These are the cesium concentrations in the organism in terms of Becquer, Becquerel's per gram uh, versus the number of children without any problems in their heart. So you can see this is the percentage of children. So by the time you get 12 to 26 becquerels of cesium-137 in your body, as measured in this little wheelchair thing I was telling you about, 40%, 40% of the children have, are without ECG modification. That means that 60% have got ECG modification. That means what is ECG modification? This is electrocardiogram. It means your heart's not working. It means that 60% of the children who've got this level, 12 to 25 becquerels per kilogram, their heart isn't working. Isn't this extraordinary? And do you know what happened to Bandashevsky when he published this and sent it to the West? He was arrested and sent to jail. He was went, he went sent to the Gulag. He was in the Gulag for three or four years. Hard labour. That's what he got as his, as his price for saving the children. And it was only because of Amnesty International and all of us anti-nuclear people shouting and screaming and the European Parliament and so on that eventually Lukashenko let him out. And they, and they gave him this special passport you know, called a, called a European um, passport. So there we are. There's, that, that's what's going to happen to the people of Fukushima. There. That, well, actually, not that, but this one. Where, where were we? The demographic one. And will it happen to the people of Tokyo also? Well, to a lesser extent, of course it will. To a lesser extent, this is this is all dependent upon uh, upon how long that they they are exposed to these materials. And uh, it doesn't have to, of course. They could find clean food for them. They could destroy all of the food. They could refuse to... They could measure... And this is what I was trying to do with my Christopher Busby Foundation with this chap, James Ryan. We wanted to buy equipment from Germany to measure the concentration of cesium in the foodstuffs mm. and to set up a laboratory there where people could bring in their rice or their fish or whatever it happened to be that they normally ate and find out whether it was whether it was radioactive or not. Because I, they're, 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 I was sent a video uh, made by the Germans of this farmer who, who, who farmed about 30 kilometers away from, from Fukushima, and he had a Geiger counter, and he thought that his rice product was radioactive. So he took it to the government laboratories to have it tested, and they said it's 350 becquerels per kilogram of cesium, and that's below the limit. 500 is the limit, okay? And he didn't believe them. So he took them to another he took it to another university department and checked it out and it turned out to be 350,000 becquerels per kilogram, okay? And so he said that's it, I'm not, you know. That's right. That's right. So the fact is that these that, that the Japanese authorities and their laboratories are just lying about this in order to keep the lid on this problem. And that's what we were trying to do something about. But not now, of course, because my friend, uh, well, colleague or whoever we, he is, James Ryan, he's been attacked into the ground and, and he's not going to do any more work on the issue. And, uh, and so they'll just have to take their chances. But this is their chances and this is what will happen to them. Can you show some more in the... Well, did we have Niagu? I think we did somewhere here. What have we got? Um... Oh, yes. But, but you this told us also that, that in the international news from, from Japan, we, we have only been informed about the, the uh, reactors, the, the, the contained uranium, but, but that in these um, hydrogen explosions, you say that, that fuel rods from the cooling dams were thrown out in the area. How far away could they be thrown? We don't know how far, but I, we certainly think over, uh, over, uh, probably over a kilometre that yeah. they've come down because they're quite heavy these rods, you know. But we've seen pictures into into the top of those reactors, into those uh, cooling ponds now that show that everything is fused into a big blob. So there's no integrity at all there now. There are no individual rods. It's just like a big mass, all like a big piece, like a big piece of lava. But this is interesting. Look at this. Just bring along this because this is my colleague Hagen Scherb. Now, Sherb is interested in sex ratio. So
So what he sh what he does Tell here? What sex ratio. Yeah, the sex ratio is the number of boys born to the number of girls. Now, in all human populations that are not affected by genetic damage, that is a constant. It's one thousand and fifty boys to what to 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 um to one thousand girls. And what Sherb has done is he's looked very carefully at the populations of Europe after the Chernobyl accident to see whether there is a genetic damage effect that can be shown by this sex ratio. And there you are, he's found one. See, look, this is in Belarus, all right? You found that there's a sudden step change in the sex ratio. I mean, if you forget his, if you forget his red line and just look at the, the, the dots, you can see that it suddenly... Then there's 1980, so there's the accident. There's the accident. And you see, after the accident, up it goes. So those people who say that Chernobyl didn't, and all of the, like, Lars Eric Holm, who say that Chernobyl had no effect, it's, it, there's the effect. It's easy to see. And it's More not, boy fetuses are yes. dying. Uh, in is this, that, that what you're saying? Uh, no, in this case, it's, it's, you get more boys. You get more boys. And the, and the reason for that I can explain, but it's mm -hmm. complicated, so I'm not going to. Um, so you can see that this, this is, even in Europe, there's a break. See, there's a break in the slope here after Chernobyl, if you take all of Europe. So this is, this is and this in, he, he worked out that this meant that there were like 40,000 dead, dead children as a result of this effect because of the loss of, 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 of boys or girls. Uh, where, where are we now? Let's, let's find... This is Sherby. There we are. That's right. Okay. There we are, sex odds ratio per millisiever. Anyway, if you want to see all of this, you'll have to see the book. I'm just, just, these are just some tasters. There's the, that's Europe. And this is Eastern, Central and Eastern Europe. You see there's an effect there as well. Let's go down and see what else I brought in here. Yes, look, look, here's Denmark, you see. Live birth sex odds in Denmark. There. These are statistically significant effects. And how much radiation from Chernobyl came to, Gen to Denmark? I mean, small amounts. And yet it was enough to perturb the sex odds ratio. What else have we got? Here's the Russian Federation. Well, there's no argument there. You see, there's 19... Oh, this is, yeah, 1986. There's the accident, and so suddenly it goes boof. But of course you'd expect that in the Russian Federation. So what have we got here? We've got... Down syndrome. So there's an effect on Down syndrome prevalence. He's a biostatistician, this guy. West Berlin. See, there's a big peak in West Berlin there. And it all happened in a few months. Yeah, sure. The so sudden why change. Did, why would you think the West Berlin had the big peak? Well, they did. They did have a. They did have a lot of rain there. Oh, oh yeah. Now this is an interesting one. They argued this. Now this is the woman who's talking about the effects of ionization ionizing radiation from Chernobyl on the embryo. And what she showed was that there were enormous effects. You see, now here's, these are, these are, no, this is not, this is, hang on. Where, where, let's find Rain. some. There we are. IQ, all right? So here's IQ. So the intelligence scale for children who were, who were irradiated, acutely exposed against the comparison group, and remember the comparison group are not not exposed, they're just from an area with lower, lower levels of, mm -hmm. of exposure. You can see that there are consistent differences in the IQ between the, the children who were exposed and the children who were not exposed. And here's, what's this? This is, this is another, this is verbal IQ. So again, you see exposed group, their verbal IQ is 106, Comparison group from Kiev, 116. So that's a big change in the IQ, 106 to 116. Yes. And here's the distribution of verbal IQ. So again, significant differences between the acutely exposed and, and the control group. And here's a whole range of, of, of um, mental and behavioral disorders. Mm. So again, we have organic personality disorders, a, a, a healthy... Uh, yeah, so... The acutely exposed group, the red one here, this is healthy, okay? So you've got only a few of them are healthy, here, 10%. Whereas the ones, or maybe it's 10, I'm not sure, these might be numbers, but anyway, the point is it's a lot less there than, than the, the, the control group. So the blue is the control group, the red is the exposed group. Mental retardation, disorders of psychological development, behavioral and emotional red disorders. Is exposed group. Yeah, the red is the exposed group. Acutely exposed group, red. Comparison group is blue. 
This is all data. This woman, Niagu, has studied these children. She, she, she's done a huge study of children in these areas. All facts. So it's all facts, that's right. Instead of all this talk that goes on about mm -hmm. how radiation is okay and the nuclear power stations are fine and so forth, when you go out there and you measure this stuff and you, and you use scientific analysis on the results, you can show without any difficulty that small amounts of radiation have tremendous and, com and complex mm -hmm. and sociologically important effects. So your society is going to suffer as a result of this. You're going to have less intelligent people. Less intelligent people means that you're at a disadvantage economically. So even from the point of economics, you don't want to have nuclear power stations because they will make all your children stupid. <laughs> <laughs> then you won't be able to compete in the international market, and wouldn't that be a shame? <laughs> don't overdo <ever> it. <laughs> anyway, is, have we gone through yeah, the yeah, research, more or less? More yeah, or less. Do, yeah. The most so, uh, no, so, this, this, so this book is available. You can buy it from, uh, from any bookseller, and you can also order it from the European Committee on Radiation Risk or from Green Audit. Uh, you can go to www.greenaudit.org um, and, and uh, buy, buy the book. And you Euradcom. Think. Yes, yes, and the European Committee on Radiation Risk. So www.euradcom.org. E-U-R-A-D-C-O-M. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Uh,